forging cyber, forging cyber security. Secure Ninja. Hey everyone, I'm Alicia Webb with Secure Ninja TV. Now, our free preview of Secure Ninja's online Sensei series has generated such a positive reaction that we've decided to give away every single module from this Cyber Kung Fu course featuring Larry Greenblatt, Tom Upchagrove, and me. If you like what you see and would like to experience a Secure Ninja training course in person at any of our training locations, we have some amazing time-sensitive specials for you. Just visit secureninja.com slash specials for all of the do not miss deals. And now here is your free module from Cyber Kung Fu for the Certified Ethical Hacker version eight. Enjoy. All right. Um in earlier modules, we saw how TCP IP works and how we use the uh, addresses at uh, particularly the transport layer and the uh, network layer, so your uh, IP address and port number, your socket address, uh, to communicate to remote systems. Um, we can use this information also, well originally in my day when I started out net building networks, to route traffic from one network to another because um, if you remember the way broadcasts work, when I send a, 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 an I, a packet to all ones, it would eat up the entire network, so routers originally were created to segment that and say, well, that, that's just going to stay here on this network. Um, well, they've uh, evolved into become security devices. In fact, the router itself is considered the traffic cop that mediates the traffic between one network and another. And we can take additional steps to make uh, security just a, a little more tighter. Um, where a firewall is a preventive device, and we think of uh, security against three processes, we prevent detect and respond, but I can't prevent everything. So I want cameras up. So I may have guards outside and, and, and uh, locked doors, but I have to let people in to do business. I have to let my employees in to do business. And I'm not necessarily trying to stop them. I need them. But so the next step is to detect, and we have things like logging servers. And in the case of network, things looking at IPs and port numbers and who are we talking to. We could go a little deeper, too, and actually inspect the content. We'll, we'll uh, take a look at some of the considerations doing that. So in addition to uh, firewalls, our preventive devices, we have IDSs, detective devices. And then at least on tests, and maybe in your configuration, a good idea would also be to maintain a honeypot. Now, um, if you know somebody is attempting to commit a crime and you just decide, I'm going to set up a lure and put a camera up there so when this person who's been plaguing, say, the neighborhood comes up, we're going to have them. Well, that's considered enticement, and that's, that's a, a very legal tactic, and many people consider their honeypots as a, an enticement technology to catch things. Um, the problem is if you, if you didn't really uh, catch somebody who intended to commit a crime, but actually this person never intended to commit a crime, and somehow they felt tricked, and your honeypot, you made it too alluring. And while I can make that very easy for you and me to understand, and, and just sitting there and say, all right, so it's a question of intent. What's the difference between enticement and entrapment? Did you catch somebody intended to commit a crime? Enticement. Uh, did you catch somebody who was tricked? Entrapment. But in legal courts, you're going to have lawyers debating this in a very fine line. So for most people, um, honeypots don't make sense. In your environment, it might. Do a risk assessment. Check with legal and HR and make sure how you're using it is legal. But let's take a look at how some of these work and how you as a penetration tester um, might be testing the effectiveness of their firewalls, their IDS and honeypots, and try to assess whether or not they're really uh, catching you or, or if there's some holes. Uh, over and over again, though, I do want to stress no pen tester actually tells you you are secure. We can just tell you, we did find a way to break through it, so you should at least fix this. But the best I can ever tell you is, I just couldn't find the, the flaw. I don't tell you it's great. All right, so refreshing here. We've been through the OSI model a couple times here. Let's uh, take a step back, and let's just draw this out again. Um, now, while we see that the uh, OSI just got more granular in TCP IP model, What's nice about the CEH uh, program is they kind of really hybrid the whole thing. So I actually like the, their simplest. They took the application layer where we would have presentation and session layer. They just call it the app, and I'm fine with that. Uh, that's what I see on my sniffer anyway. We have your transport layer. 
we have your um, uh, network layer, and then the data link layer that we care about for today. Now, later on when we get into sniffing, we're going to get below that and see how the data link layer works at the, um, at the uh, physical layer and, and communicates there, but we're really going to focus on how an application creates data. So again, Bob's sending Alice a love letter or whatever. And in order to get that letter delivered to Alice, and again, we're going to worry about these addresses. We're going to worry about these in our sniffing labs. At the transport layer, he would say to Alice from Bob, or actually we'll say more effectively uh, or more appropriately, to the web server at port 80 from my web client at uh, port whatever, and we know that it's always something about 49,000 or so, but that's in the segment header. And that segment header will live with it, but you can't just deliver a, a letter to uh, uh, Bob or uh, you know, to Alice. The mailman will need more information. So we're going to give that mailman a, uh, an IP address, the address of their house, the address of their, of their machine. And that, again, is in a packet header. And you may recall, but in an earlier module, I referred to two, these two layers, the network and the transport as a circuit level. That's the way it, it was taught to me. So when Network General came out, they came out with their sniffer and were sniffing traffic, the truth is I didn't really sniff too much data. We found it cool that you can sniff out passwords, right? Uh, and we'll look more about that in some of the sniffing vulnerabilities later on. But really what we were looking at is, is, is this type of stuff, the uh, circuit, and making sure that the circuit was completed. So why wasn't this machine talking to, uh, say, the Alice's machine over here, or the server? Well, the truth is, we don't connect machines directly to each other anymore. We, we, it, we, we had to separate, um, if for no other reason, performances, performance broadcasts had to be separated. And we did that with a router. And the router in the middle, looking at this information in the packet header, and in the OSI model, we know that would be layer three, and the transport layer is layer four, uh, it can decide, well, we know in the packet header we have source and destination networks. Right, so the router's job, basically a traffic cop that's going to say, oh, you're on 10.1.1 street and you need to get to 192.168.0 street. Okay, um, best way to get there would be to go here. Um, all right, now on a test, if anybody ever asks you where a router works, routers work at layer three. The truth is the original RFCs did not describe routing there. Routing works between here. They were called gateway to gateway protocols. And if you work on a router, you'll know that that's true because I can create access control lists based on TCP, UDP, ICMP message types, port numbers. So in real life, routers really are circuit level devices. I've never seen a test uh, other than the CISSP want that answer. So if I were taking anyone else's test and they say, oh, what layer is the router working? You always say layer three. Uh, but Looking at this information, I can also create an access control list to filter and say you can be permitted or denied to get to this IP or port number this, uh, you know, from this IP to that IP, from this port to that port. So our very first firewalls are routers. Right. A router working at layer three and layer four, can make a static packet filter. It's static in that once I permit traffic in, it's always allowed in. I, I, I could say you're not allowed in, and you're never allowed in. Consider me in, in 1994, 95 having to do this, and remember when I talk to a server, I might go to its well-known port on 80, but it's going to come back to me on some high port. 
And in those days, it could have been anything above 1023. I literally had to open up every port from 1023 on up. And if you did that today, you'd be owned very quickly, right? So um, it's nice. They can do some stuff. And uh, later on, I'll point out that these things have not gone away. Sometimes people call these screening routers. It was a, an old NIST term from SP8010. So we're going to call this, just to, in case you get caught up on that, a screening router. Okay, but barring from the Middle Ages, a new type of firewall came out. And these were uh, mid-90s, we're talking about 94 or so. And barring a term from the Middle Ages, uh, we developed a proxy. Now, a proxy uh, is, is some middleman on behalf of, uh, of, of someone else, and it, and it would work like this. And imagine someone comes knocking on the door, yes, I have a message for your king. Oh, hey, come on. And then, then your highness, I wanted to tell you this, and he stabs him. When his son took the throne, Jeeves, could you just relay a message for me? Now, remember our OSI model, real quickly here. App, transport, net, a circuit level firewall might just forward the attack, right? We see now we can set up covert channels. I can send anything over anything. I can set net bios over port uh, 80 using your netcat tools, which you're going to do later, but you're going to, so, tell your highness I said this, your highness he said this. So we had to look deeper. We had to look into the data. Now, not necessarily the actual, say, the content of the email, but there should have been, not just my segment packet header, but right below that, right behind that is my SMTP header. So I could say, all right, Port 25 is allowed in to this IP address, but let's look a little deeper. That is not mail. Or even within mail, SMTP has a lot of protocol uh, commands in there. And in enumeration, just to plant a seed, there are a couple SMTP commands that servers don't really say to each other. For instance, VRFY. That verifies a mailbox name. That is not a server. Servers don't say that to each other, even though it is a valid SMTP command. Uh, another one you want to look out for your test would be EXPN. That's going to enumerate mail lists. And if there's a list admins for this department or whatever, again, that's something that uh, no mail server would actually type. That's a guy at a telnet prompt. So an application layer firewall will know to look you know, not just at the contextual information in the IP packet header and the segment header, but we're going to look a little further. It's not the same as deep packet inspection. Deep packet inspection says I'm going to look at everything. And the downside to that is it takes a long time. Now, I don't know what's true. I have, I teach in the Beltway and I hear all kinds of paranoid stories. No matter what you think is true, there's a guy down there going, oh no, dude, the NSA, they got tools, man. They're, they're looking at everything you do, dude. They've got, you know, whatever, carnivore, and, and, and uh, uh, I forget the name of the other, uh, big, but, but um, I don't know, I also get guys in my class who are from ISPs, big ISPs, uh, Comcast and Sprint, and they go, dude, if I turned on full logging on my servers, and we've got OC768, you know, almost 40 gigs per second, do you know how quickly my hard drives would fill up? So I don't know. I just leave it open and go, I don't know. It's an old saying, if you can't measure something, you can't speak matter-of-factly with it. So that's why I love my sniffer tools. At least I can measure those. All right, so that proxy then, what's sometimes called the Gen 2 firewall of routers with static packet filters of Generation 1, a Gen 2 is the proxy. Now, a proxy can work at the circuit level, and just look at that. That's a circuit level proxy. Very common one in my day, Chrome. It's still very popular, I say out there. It's socks, and it's called socks because we know that a combination of IP address and a port number is a socket. And where I really see it, your own admins. I go to a big place, a big organization, and I, I'm trying to get a tool, and I, I can't get to this website. And one of your admins goes, "Where are you trying to go?" I can get anywhere. He set up a circuit level proxy, a sock server at home, and he uses SSH to get to it. Yeah, some of your, the people violating your, your policies the most are your own people. And I don't want to say that's always bad.
because sometimes that guy might have saved your job and your policies are too constrained. So I'm just warning you, these things happen. But an application layer proxy would go further. Now the application layer proxy, again, is not doing deep packet inspection. It is looking at headers and validating that, again, is that HTTP behind port 80? And then within that, is it a valid uh, command? So if you ask me, actually, that would be the safest way to go. But the downside to doing all that is it's slow. And I want to warn any test taker on any type of security test, I noticed something and in my intro, I believe I called that semantics of business vocabulary and business rules. Any developer will tell you the hardest stage in development is functional requirements. So when you're reading a test question, you got to understand the requirements. Semantics of business vocabulary says not everybody uses the same word the same way. So when you say you're saying it wrong, no, they say it different, that's all. So for instance, in my experience, the way I was coming up, when you wanted a, a router or a firewall to not allow, uh, to deny traffic, you block the packet. And when I see the word block, I know it's by policy. Block that packet, we don't let it in here. Dropped packet for me meant I couldn't keep up with the load. Oh, I, oh that's a lot of the processing, sorry, just kind of dropped the packet. But I notice not everybody uses that. The semantics of that business vocabulary to other people is just another word for, for block. So whenever you take a test, or in any case, I say drop a packet, or a customer's complaining, it drop packets. Make sure you read into it. Did they mean by policy, as in blocked, or did they mean, my experience, processing couldn't keep up? And that was a big deal. Uh, security always gets in the way. Security slows you down. It, it slowed me down to brush my teeth here this morning. Uh, there were red lights. I could have just ran them, but it, it's not safe, right? So uh, what I don't want to do is wait at a red light when no one's coming. And if you have an electric toothbrush that works faster, I'm taking it. And if there is a way to examine this better, I'll do that too. And that's where Checkpoint came in with the Gen 3 firewall. Now I don't know that it's better, but it's a consideration. Gen 3 is known as stateful inspection and actually Checkpoint, I believe, trademark that term, so I'll list it here, but you won't rarely see it in someone else's book, they'll call it stateful, but it's stateful inspection. It is a packet filter, it's a packet filter, but it's dynamic. Dynamic and it's, I'm gonna write that down here. Now not everybody uses the same default rules, but a very common uh, firewall rule is no one's allowed in unless it was explicitly asked by somebody on the inside. And everyone's allowed out unless per explicitly denied you're not allowed. Now, I don't know, that's always a good idea. I always tell you to do a risk assessment first and see what works best for your organization. But let's assume no one's allowed in and I'm the stateful inspection firewall and I'm the guard at the door. No one's allowed in here. But a guy on the inside says, hey, I'm uh, sending a packet off to Microsoft and he's going to, oh, I'm sorry, your IP address is 10.1.1.3. You're going to, I think the DNS tells me that is at 149.67. Your source port, 5023 going to port 80. Uh-huh. Your initial sequence number? Mm-hmm. Sending him a SYN, I take it. All right. I'll keep my eyes open for a SYNAC from this IP to that IP, that port to that port, acknowledging that sequence number. And when it comes in, Ah, we've been expecting you. Come on in. That didn't happen in the proxy, did it? Proxy didn't really let him in. If you remember network address translation, right, where uh, I go out as, uh, as um, you know, inside I'm, I'm 192.168, but they translated me. And on the outside, all people see is a single IP address. It's a little harder to figure out what's going on inside. So, the proxy adds a little extra layer of protection. Now again, they may proxy the attack, so it doesn't always work, but I'd say it's one extra thing. Um, I like to use the analogy, uh, I put money in a safe, um, but I put the safe behind a painting. So now they gotta find the safe. I wouldn't put my money behind the painting, but it does add some security, all right? Now, these are traditionally what you think of uh, as your generations of firewalls, one, two, and three but things have grown a lot. So for your test, this is probably fine um, for almost any test. 
But today's, uh, even I, I was doing uh, uh, Cisco uh, administration years ago, and Cisco was a, um, a stateful inspection type of firewall. It would uh, process things here. Now, again, there's no state information in UDP. So I, TCP has state information. UDP does not. But the DNS application up here does. So if you didn't do a DNS request, I'm not going to allow in a DNS reply. So we examine packets at layer three, uh, process them all the way up to the application, and then they deliver them back out on layer three. So we've been doing this, and, and Cisco actually says once they, uh, and this will go back to the late 90s, once they realized that contextually this was fine, everything else was done at layer three because it was just faster. So again, these are the basic descriptions. This will get you through the test, or any test, but consider today's firewalls do not really uh, fit neatly in this category. And something that I haven't seen brought up, um, and I'm sure if anybody, it would be the CEH who will bring this up, um, there are web application firewalls when we get into the securing web servers that only really look at this. That's their major job. So um, are you entering in SQL commands when I ask you to put in your name? So a web application firewall, a WAF, uh, not discuss, uh, discussed in any class I teach, but definitely a consideration if you're doing any type of e-commerce or trying to secure a web server. Um, we also have personal firewalls. Um, I, it's been my experience, though, that uh, on tests, they almost never refer to a personal firewall. If they just see the term firewall, think of a, de a device in the middle. All right. Um, how can I know if a firewall is passing a rule? When a router blocks something, we saw this in our scanning lab, I send a packet to a server and the, fly, the router says you can't get there. Well, it'll give me a uh, ICMP type 3 unreachable message, code 13, administratively prohibited. But a firewall is not going to tell you anything. A good firewall shouldn't tell you anything. Well, suppose I consider that behind any firewall is a router. Right. And I, I believe I introduced this earlier in the scanning lab. But now it should have a little, take a little more context. So I know that behind some organization there's a firewall. And almost everybody, this is the, the diode, the Visio diode for a firewall, uh, behind any firewall is typically a router that's going to route you to the proper DMZ or subnet or whatever. And perhaps behind here there is a, a few servers. I want to see if they're, I want to see if that's a mail server. And I'm out here as the tester. And I've done a trace route as part of the reconnaissance. And I've discovered that the firewall is 14 hops away. I will send a scan with a TTL of 15. I will not be able to get to that next network. I want to see if they're alive but they're not going to let me there because I know that once the TTL expires, this router will return back ICMP type 11. I told you that would be important in your future, and that is time exceeded in transit. Same way trace route works. If I got that message back, then that firewall passed it. Somebody's doing 25 back there. Why else would he have 25 open? If the firewall blocked it, I wouldn't get anything back. So, what are you ways to do this? But the first tool I ever heard that could do this, and the one that you'll need to know for your test, is called Firewalk. Right. Very testable tool. Works by what I call inference. It's not that it told you it was up. It's what it didn't tell you. Right. The fact that it lets something else through, I just know he was letting something up. Very important uh, process, and please keep that in mind for your scanning. Now, let's go a little bit further down here. As we uh, look down to the OSI model, we see that, well, wait a second, I've got not just the packet and segment header, I've got frame headers. 
I wondered why my firewall really needed an IP address. I've been asking that for years. I wonder, um, why don't I have a device, why don't I put a device with two network interface cards in it, one on one network, it has no layer three address, there's no IP, it's kind of the way when we sniff, it can read in everything and process and deliver it back out and it's totally invisible. And I wasn't the only person asking that. And that's one of the advantages of an IPS. So not a lot of questions on the test on an IPS, but IPSs to me are just advanced firewalls. It's an intrusion prevention device. What's my firewall? An intrusion prevention device. But it wasn't just the firewall. When we loaded these out in the 90s, it was a uh, NAT device. It was your VPN endpoint. And I personally like a multifunction device. I have a, a Leatherman tool, it's got scissors on it. it it's got a nail file, it's got a, the, a pliers, it's great. Um, but my miter circular saw is not also a spork. So when you want an industrial strength tool, maybe you want to consider a dedicated appliance. And IPSs, to me, uh, make a lot more sense if you really want to look at uh, preventing intrusions. All right. Now, we already looked at the TCP header format. We know these fields. So again, as a stateful firewall, I can examine these fields. I could also do this as an IDS. IDSs will, uh, like IPSs, process things from uh, layer two up. So I can look at the frame and uh, just examine it individually and then look at everything in there and see if this looks suspicious. Um, now there's some fields, if you look at the urgent field, it's 16 bits. I've never seen it used. It looks like a good covert channel. I don't know how to write a rule for that. Uh, UDP doesn't have a lot going on in there. Um, well, let's go back to another uh, uh, TCP segment. Suppose there was an IDS here, and I'm worried about the IDS picking up my attack. Now, I've done my reconnaissance. So I'm going to say there is a router between uh, the target and the IDS. And we did a little bit of this uh, on our scanning. I just want to expand on that. And now, it doesn't matter where I am. I, I just, again, through trace route, determine how many hops away is this guy. So again, if it's, whatever, 15 hops away, uh, I'm going to send, say I send a SYN to the server, SYN ACK, and he sees it. Uh, I ACK it, he sees it. But then I send a reset. With a TTL of 14. So the IDS goes, oh, oh, never mind, that's been closed. I send the, the, some data and he says, no, no, I, 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 no I don't know what that is. That must have been arrived out of order. Now, that doesn't mean you can't tune your IDS rule sets. These are just some of the methods hackers have tried over the years. And some people buy IDSs and install them and think they work by themselves. And it's not exactly true, does it? All right. Uh, another thing people have done is uh, I could send the same sequence. I send the malicious data. Or actually, I send a decoy data first. So, so I, I'm going to send packet sequence, say, bytes 1,000 through 2,000. And I send it, and it looks, looks nice, but with a TTL of 14. He receives it. I send it again. This time, it has the actual attack in it. But the TTL is now uh, fixed, so he'll see it. The IDS says, that's a duplicate. I already have that sequence. You know, uh, one of my considerations, I'll say it again if I've always, but um, Bruce Schneier was questioned, what is the difference between security engineering and safety engineering? And he says, uh, well, security engineering, and I think he retold from somebody else, but this is what I heard from him, uh, deals with Murphy's Law. If something could go wrong, eventually it will. But security engineering deals with Satan's law. If something could go wrong, there's a malicious son of a out there that's going to make it go wrong. So you look at these things and why would somebody do that? Because that's how some people think. All right, uh, also in that TCP header, I did mention options. And if you're tuning a network, that's really, really important. But I just never see it exploited in any of my security tests. But those RFC 13, 16 options, just real quick, you know, your window size of 16 bits is a big bottleneck. You can increase that on Google. It's usually my uh, 
biggest. Google, I've seen increase it by as much as nine bits. Actually, one exception. Megumi Takshita out of Japan had the largest window size. She had uh, 10 bits of scaling, so it's awesome. It was, two for the, it was 65, five through six with 10 bits of scaling. UDP does not have a lot going on here, so pretty easy for a, a firewall to just at least look at port numbers, but we can't tell what's in the data unless I'm doing deep packet inspection. Uh, the IP4 data RAM header, we've looked at this before, and again, I've mentioned how uh, hackers have manipulated fragmentation to um, uh, bypass a firewall. Now, I've given a couple of examples, but one of the most famous I did not talk about. In a TCP header, I, well, typically in a, a pack, I have my packet header, right, IP address, and then I have my segment header, and the TCP information is right here. Now, remember our flags. I have sin and fin. Using fragmentation, people have created a fragment right in the middle of there. IDS says, no, I did not see any one frame come in with both sin and fin set. Nice. So uh, again, that was uh, to enumerate using the TTLs, I called that firewalk. Another tool you're gonna be tested on is called frag route. Now, there are many tools that can do this by, by today. It's just the first tool I knew that could do it, and it's very testable. So frag route can use fragmentation to elude the IDS. Right. Um, couple of ways of eluding an IDS, and I want you to consider uh, IDS as a closed circuit television system, right? So when we get into evasion, let, let's um, consider that you're, you don't stop anybody with a closed circuit television, right? And do you think you catch people regularly on camera? No. Rarely does that happen. There's a report of an incident, somebody says, play back the tape, and let's see what we got. All right, so again, our network flow information, just uh, uh, to, to uh, restress this. So we typically think of the globally significant information, globally significant meaning this is gonna happen. When I go to uh, Microsoft.com, this information generally stays the same. The IP and port number, my source IP, source port, destination IP, uh, and together those make a socket. So in this case, I have Internet Explorer uh, on this IP address, this layer four address, he's got a, a high port, uh, 52,000. He's gonna to talk to uh, destination port 443, and you should know for your test, of course, that is uh, very likely SSL. Um, his layer three address, uh, 192.168.1.23, and his uh, destination 10.1.1.2. And together, that makes the socket. SOX firewall, socket addressing, sockets-based applications. But really, we have to put things on, and we're gonna know way more about this in the sniffing lab. I have to put a real envelope a header that the mailman can deliver. So no mailman picks up a letter and says, oh, to China, well, I guess I'm gonna have a long drive. No, the, he's in a car, he's gonna drop it off at the nearest mail depot. So that's the locally significant information. So uh, if this machine here, this client was talking to this server, the source MAC address, or layer two, the locally significant address, would be his workstation, but the destination would be the router. That router is gonna strip off that frame header, rebuild it, source MAC, destination MAC, source MAC, destination MAC. But our firewalls don't typically care about that because it's stripped off at every uh, router hop. So most of our uh, firewall um, rules start at layer three, do I let this IP, then port, and then you start looking deeper. All right, now, uh, as I came up with networks, we had different devices at different layers. Um, at first, what we were worried about is a, a attenuation of an electrical signal. So um, attenuation, I, I send out uh, you know, five volts, and it goes to zero, and after a while it goes down. And it's kind of like you know, my voice would attenuate as I got into the larger room. So you might have a repeater. Uh, Multiport repeaters are hubs. And the um, hub would forward all traffic. It's kind of funny, we've had switches out now uh, since the 90s and I can buy a layer two switch, eight port for like $10. So to me, a hub should be a nickel. But it's like, oh, you want a hub? You want to sniff, don't you? Yeah, when we get into sniffing, we're gonna see why that's a lot easier for you to sniff with the hub. 
But what we our, did with our bridges was break up our collision domains, and, and we'll get more into that also in the switching lab. It's, it's, it's not really important for us here. Um, the router, and again, on any test, is a network layer device looking at source and destination, uh, primarily network address, and say, can I forward that? but I can put in access controls. And a gateway is a very generic term, so when I started out, that's really what separated the men from the boys. If you could take your, your 30 user Novell LAN and connect it to an IBM mainframe, and today it just means anything that could connect this thing to that thing. So it's a very generic term. Notice uh, in my model here too, I have the circuit level somewhere in the middle of the session. Um, considering the OSI seven layer model didn't really work, there is no exact map what layer should be what layer. So where I traditionally think of the circuit level as network and transport, I've had other good arguments made to me that the session layer is really where it kind of starts. So I drew a kind of in the middle there. So again, the router, as we discussed, is our, um, our traffic comp, and it, and it decides where, what network are you going to? Well, stop, let me see. And it was there initially to stop broadcast domains. Um, but I don't want to sit there and have to manually configure every network so routers speak to each other using routing protocols. Um, let's consider how these routing protocols work. I have three routers. Router A is connected to the 10 network. He's connected to router B. And they're both connected to router C, and C is the, the 11 network. I want to send a, 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 a packet from, uh, from 10 to uh, 12. Well, it looks like the best route to take would be just go A to C. And that's exactly what the very first routing protocol would do, RIP. RIP is a distance vector protocol. meaning it's only critical to quality metric is, well, which one's closer, and it measures that in hop count. Problem is, this might have been a 56K line. Now, these are two T3s, and that was not really a good choice. So a much smarter protocol was developed called OSPF. And there's a bunch of them out there uh, that can do this, uh, but OSPF is open source. So that's the one you'll typically have to deal with on a test. Uh, if I had to, I would definitely run Cisco's EIGRP, but let's not talk about that. This is a link state. Now, a link state protocol is a little smarter. It's going to take into account, well, what's the state of the link right now? And its default state, it takes into account its bandwidth. So we go, no, this is a much better way to go. And all of this runs in my domain, or in routing, we call that an autonomous system but there are other autonomous systems out there. So if I have one route to the internet and I don't know where to go, I say, all right, if you don't know where it is, go here. Take my default route. But for fault tolerance and load balancing, many organizations have decided to get two routes. And now I have to figure out which one's better. Where these run inside my company, their interior, I'm gonna run something like BGP, the exterior protocol, now, um, uh, I don't want to get too far into it because I don't know of any test questions on it, but BGP is very long in the tooth. It uses an MD5 hash password. I'm sure there are ways to do this over SSL and SSH, but as far as I have researched, it's extremely vulnerable. And I brought this up in uh, a, at a, a class in 2005, and a very, very uh, bright teacher, uh, uh, Mike Poor, turned around and he just said, Dude, we're all waiting for BGP attacks. All we can figure is that the kids don't want to break their playground yet, but it's not kids anymore. Right? Since that time, most of the hacks today we find are very well organized, uh, state-sponsored in many cases, or at least some uh, organized crime and, and often a mix between the two. So uh, I don't consider myself that bright. Uh, if I'm thinking, I imagine at least 100 others have caught that, and I just assume all the BGP routers are hacked. And one thing you have to keep in mind when you're being hacked, um, for example, my drummer, uh, he, he gets a phone, a smartphone, and he starts sending a bunch of inappropriate, humorous messages. And I said, you know, this is a great way to uh, spread malware. And he goes, yeah, that's what I, I told my wife that she said that uh, I could be spreading viruses, but I've had this phone for three months and it, and it still works. They're not trying to break you guys. They're trying to use you to commit the crime. 
In fact, I find it kind of humorous that um, it, it, we have a big challenge here in the United States getting uh, network admins. It's tough. I, I pick on our kids. They're not they're interested. Where do you think Al-Qaeda is? I have three letter guys in my class that say, dude, we have to break into their networks constantly to patch them. Because if we don't fix them, they go down. And then we can't see what they're up to. That's awesome. Uh, so no BGP attacks on the test. A very big consideration, I would think, if I was running a network and you're running uh, multiple nodes, so you want to secure that. We don't just want to pass a test. We want to you know, learn to defend ourselves. All right, but by putting in um, our access control list, permit or deny uh, certain IPs, import numbers, or protocols, I see even message types, I can create my very first firewall. All right. A router's job is to receive an incoming packet, uh, see if it knows the destination network address, uh, and then forward it on its way. Now, it has a couple other things to do. Recall an IDS evasion. I could send packets with bad checksums. Routers have to decrement a TTL. And when they do that, they recompute a checksum. And if they don't check incoming checksums, you can use them as zombies to fix broken things to do IDS evasion. Uh, but I can also see, and you can see down at the bottom here, uh, I can also filter based on layer three and layer four information. So again, on uh, most tests, routers, packet filters work at layer three. Heads up to anybody taking their CISSP. I understand they, under, they know the truth, and they actually say between what two layers or may. And that's a very good thing to understand. They're actually quite right in my opinion. All right, so the firewalls, just recapping here, we had Gen 1 is a static packet filter on your test. That is a layer three device. Uh, Gen 2 is the proxy, which could be application or circuit level. Uh, we know that application layers are going to look deeper into the protocol commands. Uh, and stateful inspection, originally layer three, um, but there's no state information in UDP, so we have to process it up. Uh, Checkpoint did trademark that term, and you go to their website and they'll say, we'll receive a packet at layer three, process it up to the application, drop it back out on layer three. Um, now I'm going to publish systems to the internet. I've had a few different uh, suggestions over the year. NIST, in a very old document, SP 800-10, 1994, before we would have stateful inspection, recommended a couple things. Uh, one way is to take a, a, a router, a screening router, I set up access controllers, and I uh, put a, a single leg proxy behind it, which they called an application gateway. And then I have my servers that I'm uh, offering to the outside world, maybe an external DNS, an external mail server, my web server. Uh, but I also have my internal users that are going out to surf. And the job of the uh, application gateway, or actually the firewall to them, they called it the screened host firewall. It was actually two devices. And the idea was a packet had to come in, be inspected by the gateway before it was allowed to be forwarded. One, one interface? Let's put two interfaces in that. All right, so that was the next kind. If this was the screened host firewall, let's take that gateway, put two interfaces in it, and when I do that, I'm, I say that this thing now has a network, or has a home on two different networks. That's great. So same kind of thing. I, I won't draw these devices. I have my application gateway software. Keep in mind, we didn't have firewall appliances in the 90s. You took a compact ProLiant server and you put like Red Hat or, or uh, um, uh, NT on it and you loaded software on it. And both of these said, oh, you got two network cards in there? Oh, let's start doing IP forwarding, kind of like a router. So you've got this firewall software telling this packet coming in here, you're not allowed in here, and the router says, come on in. So whenever you saw, see something about dual home, a dual home firewall. Look for the answer, because it was definitely a, a, a checkbox we had to do. Disable, now sometimes I'll call it routing, but this thing didn't really run RIP or OSPF. It's just doing IP forwarding. I'll take it and put it there. So they might call it IP forwarding. But either way, I don't like having my surfers on the same subnet as the servers I'm advertising, because I know strangers are allowed here. So the next design was to take two of these routers. So I'm out to the internet, I get my, now they called it screened subnet.
I put my uh, public servers out here. And I have my regular surfers here. And I like to get through life with fewer keystrokes. I've heard people call this a DMZ, and that's fine with me. So it's a very common term. You may see screen submit versus DMZ uh, to describe this thing. But then I noticed something else happened. Semantics of business vocabulary and business rules. Not everybody uses the same terms the same way. It was very common in the 90s setting up firewalls. In fact, my job, no matter why I showed up at your site in 95 through 97, uh, was not just to fix the printer. It was to say, hey, you guys connected to the internet? Do you have a firewall? And try to sell you a firewall. And we always did things like this by default. Three interfaces on the uh, firewall. This was the untrusted outside. This is the trusted network, my internal network. But this was my DMZ or uh, semi-trusted. And uh, people, uh, Cisco people might remember assigning weights, right? So your default weight was this is like, this is 100, totally trusted, and this is zero. And you put numbers in here because you might have different DMZs. Um, Steve Northcutt, one of the brightest guys I've ever worked with in this field, uh, pointed something out to me. And he said, do you know where we got the term DMZ? From Korea. And pardon my crude drawing of Korea, but north, south, they did not hang a third island off to the side. It's the area in the middle. And Steve's point wasn't just, uh, you know, semantics. It's a matter of if somebody hacks this firewall, they're all the way in. So a safer design, depending on your risk assessment, might be much more appropriate for you, is to have two firewalls. And the DMZ is here. And now I hear people call this a screen subnet, this a DMZ. Yeah, it depends on your needs. Now, when I put things out here, when I put something in a DMZ, whether it's here or here, I put them out there because I know outside people can hit it. This is my public web server, for instance. It's hard to do patch management. We said in scanning uh, at our last module uh, uh, that the vulnerabilities we discover are, f the, the vendor comes out with a patch, we have to patch it, but the patch frequently breaks things. You can't just patch things in the middle of the day. These systems have to be hit first. Anything on your DMZ is, vulner is more exposed to any threat. When you turn off unnecessary services, make sure this thing is patched, the latest signatures, you are hardening that host. You are fortifying that host. And a French word for fortify is bastion. Only bastion hosts should be in a DMZ. Another device I probably want out here, besides the, the systems I'm advertising, is an IDS, because I know untrusted people can get here. But let's get back to this term. Again, semantics of business vocabulary and business rules. Hardest part in development, understanding what that person actually said. Hardest part, taking anybody's test. What did they mean when they said bastion host? So let's go back and look up what bastion host means according to Google. Well, my second definition down here from SANS, very well-respected organization, a bastion host is a computer that is fully exposed to attack. The system is on the public side of the DMZ, unprotected by a firewall or filtering, and I believe that's router next. Why would I have one of those? Again, in the 90s, we didn't have firewall appliances. The first one I ever saw like that was when Nokia came, a checkpoint on Nokia. They were generic machines. The firewall was the bastion host. In most uh, uh, requirements, when I hear people ask me, um, what is a bastion host, are they on a test? They want a hardened host. But you may see this answer periodically, and I always pick it, because it seems that, well, if Sans said it, it must be true. All right, so again, we want to pass your test. I also want you to be able to defend yourself. Um, on a test, you put honeypots out there. I don't know. 
Um, I'm very concerned that my honeypot might get hacked. I didn't realize it yet, and it's being used to attack the White House or something worse. So I find that very scary for me. But depending on your risk assessment, depending on your line of business, it might be a good thing. If you're going to use it as evidence, the latest I've heard from people is this. If I set up a honeypot out here in my DMZ, well, I invited people to come here. Lawyers are calling that entrapment. That doesn't mean you can't have one there. Just don't use it as evidence that you caught somebody. But if the honeypot is here, and that's not Hewlett Packard, um, then you may be able to use evidence because they never should have gotten beyond there. But again, you may not, you're, I'm not doing it to catch people. I'm doing it just to see what they're up to. Uh, I've heard as far back as 2009 that uh, an ISP, uh, I won't mention them, that they looked at the IP4 address space. And if you look at the IP4 address space, it should look like a very badly fragmented hard drive. There's a lot of IPs that, you know, we gave assigned in like the Class A range, but people aren't using them. They're always in use. So they set up a honey net of over 300,000 virtual machines, and this is 2009, uh, to see what types of things go on up there. So there are definite good reasons to use them. I, I agree with, uh, you know, if you're, you're a researcher, I'm not in that field. I'm worried that I, I would get mine hacked. I didn't realize it and something bad would happen. So if you're going to use a honeypot, please consider it carefully. All right, it's uh, the uh, Norris Town Local again. And I think they follow me because I love trains and I've been teasing our director uh, back here, John, uh, big train nut. And I, I grew up with them. They're behind my house. I just love it. So I think they, they're here to keep me company. All right, so um, uh, looking at that, the flow information uh, or, or the, the socket information, IP and port, and then processing deeper if we need to, uh, the, the data or at least protocol headers, I can now look at traffic and say, does this look normal or is this some type of attack? Right, so that's it, the goal. Think of an intrusion detection system as closed circuit television. You don't know. So you're not trying to prevent anything. This person might really be shopping. They might be stealing. You don't know, so you just keep a record. And then if something's stolen later. Now, we have uh, ways to categorize these in a very simple way, a network-based IDS, a NIDS. It's really a sniffer. Um, and in fact, I, I had the uh, pleasure to take uh, Marty Roche's uh, class on Snort 2002. Marty Roche, the author of Snort. And I thought it very funny. He says, now, why did I call it Snort? Because Sniffer was already taken. So it's what it is. It's, uh, when we um, went through our sniffing lives, we, we saw it. You, you turn a card into pr promiscuous mode, you process all traffic, and then uh, you can examine it all. Well, just take that and add in a database or some type of AIs to look at it and go, wait a minute, does this look normal? Well, there's two ways to do that. Um, I could have a signature for a known attack. Sin and fin set in the same TCP header? I don't think so. I know that. It's a scan. Um, or I just go, wow, I've never seen anything like that before. We could also do that on a host as well. We have host-based IDS so just sitting on my workstation. Wow, why is somebody trying to write to your System32 directory? Now? So uh, I, I could look a weird, either, again, known patterns, a, a signature, or an unusual pattern. I just never had that. Now, in 2002, Marty was not a big fan of anomaly-based IDSs. He had some good points. He said that uh, the, the criticism of a signature-based IDS is if it's a new attack, um, you won't see it. You will have the, uh, uh, what they call in any test a false negative. It was an attack, but you didn't see it. Marty's point at that time was, he said, do you know how big the snort community is? If there's an attack that comes out Tuesday morning at 10 o'clock, I bet you by 10, 15, we got a rule for it. All right, fair enough, fair enough. Uh, and, and his point uh, about anomaly-based IDS, they go by different uh, names, but anomaly-based IDS um, or behavior-based, uh, they're more like, he says, well, okay, you train to what your network normally looks like, and then it picks up something that wasn't normal, and even if it was an attack, what will it tell you? And in his words, it was something like, huh? All right, he says, Snort tells you it's code red, it matched this rule. Things have changed, and um, snort, not just snort, rules have gotten really long, and it slows things down, and these attacks are coming out really fast. And, um, you know, there are some patterns of behavior. I don't really have to do deep packet inspection. If I just look at, uh, in my environment, for example, clients talk to servers. They don't talk to other clients. So just as soon as I see somebody looking, a client trying to talk to other clients, it just seems weird to me. 
and I don't have to have a signature of that packet. So today's IDS is really your best policy is to probably do a little bit of both. Um, you got to watch out for some of the terminologies, the semantics of business vocabulary, I keep stressing here, but behavior based. I, I, this is what my, na my network normally look like. If you could even know what normal is. But let's say you, you train it and this is what, you know, a month's worth of traffic or something. Um, wow, that's unusual behavior. Another way to say that, that's anomalous. Um, statistically, I've never seen anything like that before. Or uh, heuristic uh, patterns here don't match that, right? So heuristics is a series of patterns. Um, so they go by different names, but they're really saying the same thing. And be careful, don't let them throw you off. The two ways I can tell if it's an attack, I've seen it before, I know what that is, or I've never seen that before, um, I wonder what it is. Right. Now, just like anybody could evade a closed circuit television, just think of simple movies, right? How do they evade them? There's a couple basic ways. Um, you could uh, just spray paint the cameras. All right, I could denial of service attack these sensors. That's going to be very noticeable. Um, and, and again, when we did password cracking, I said, I could reset your password, but you'd notice it. If I cracked your password, you might not notice it. I could kick your door in very easily. It's a lot easier to kick a door in than it is to pick a lock, but you'd notice it. So we don't want to DOS the sensor necessarily. You might not want to know. All right, so what are the other ways people will evade uh, closed circuit television? They tiptoe underneath where the, where the, no, no, it doesn't pick up anything below two feet. So that would be um, an evasion attack. Um, another way to do that, though, is insert a picture of the room with nobody in it in front of the camera. That's an insertion attack. I insert misleading data. All right, so let's take another look at this. In uh, evasion attack, I'm going to try to pick up something or send something to this victim, I should say, that the IDS would not detect. So we had discussed using fragmentation uh, or uh, manipulating TTLs. Um, I like to look at the TTL one. There's a lot of ways to do this, but it's pretty easy for people to visualize sometimes. So again, I have a router, say, in between uh, this IDS and the victim. And I send um, a, a, an attack with bad checksums. Well, the IDS, by default, may say, oh, that's, that's a bad packet. Um, don't have to worry about it. But routers, again, to be fast, have not always checked incoming checksums. So um, what would happen in this scenario is IDS detects nothing, it's bad, the router fixes it, the victim gets hit. Lovely. But let's imagine you have cameras everywhere. There's no place, no way to, to evade it. So the other way is to insert misleading data. And I remember, uh, and it's also using, in, in my case, it was uh, these TTLs. So we were able to do this. There was an old reverse shell vulnerability on CompPike's Insight Manager. I forget the exact syntax, but it was like, you put in, say, the client down here, the attacker, is going to put in his, uh, the IP address of this server. And he's going to be able to remotely manage it. And the way it worked was you would put in the IP address, and then the port number for uh, the default was 8080. Uh, but if you put in, like, 50 forward slashes in a row and then cmd.exe, quote, um, you would get a reverse shell. So let me draw that out on the board so it makes it a little clearer. All right. Imagine again, through a reconnaissance attack, I noticed that I am closer to the IDS, you know, some TTL closer than the victim is. In this case, it was uh, Insight Manager. Right? And we were able to do this. Yeah, I needed to send cmd.exe. But let's say that that's the rule. The, the IDS says look for cmd. And if they're doing that, that's bad, that's an intrusion, they're gonna to try to get a reverse shell. So I send my C, and they see a C, and he sees a C. And then I send my M, and he sees an M. And then I send something misleading, an X. With a TTL of one less than this router will forward. Oh, time exceeded in transit. Now I send my D. He got hit with it, CMXD, nothing wrong with that. Actually, one of the cooler things I've heard people do, and this goes back uh, uh, many, many years, an IDS can classify an attack, right? So uh, typically, you maybe say, class one, these are very dangerous attacks. And uh, class five, ah, oh, that's not so bad. You know, it can be spam, the mail server will get it. So let me show you something on the, on the uh, right. You, you create maybe uh, a, a using our class tools, maybe you used, um, uh, ProRat or uh, Poison Ivy, and you build this new malware, right? 
So you want to know, is it going to get caught? So you upload it to VirusTotal.com. And when I go to VirusTotal, uh, I upload my file and I go, wow, is this going to get caught? And they're going to run it against the top uh, antivirus software in the world. And if it comes up clean, you, maybe you can get it past them. But remember the way anomaly-based uh, detectors work, and it's not just an IDS now, we do this for, for antivirus uh, detection. When I see something new, I go, wow, I don't know what that is. I wonder what that could be. So instead of making it clean, if you know the rule set of their IDS, include a signature for a low-risk attack. So it's not like, I don't know what that is, let's look closer. It's, oh, I know, I know what that is, and they're wrong, sucker. Uh, so I, I've said it over and over again, but remember, they tell us you have the things you know that you know, the things you know that you don't know, and many people warn you, but it's the things you didn't know that you didn't know that caused trouble. And I will argue over and over again, no, nope, you left out a Boolean fourth choice. What about the things you thought you knew that turned out to be wrong? So that would be a case right here. All right, so in conclusion, uh, we, we learned that uh, as a penetration tester, our target organization is going to have some security devices, preventive, detective, and, and response controls. Um, we want to try to uh, bypass these to test the effectiveness of this control. Just as an inspiring, I want to see, are your blocks really effective? Are you looking down here? Stuff like that. So um, for your test, there are some tools we're going to have to be aware of, and you'll see these in the labs. But firewalk, again, this is the one that's going to manipulate TTLs to determine whether or not a firewall is uh, allowing a port through. Frag route could be used to evade IDSs. Now be careful. Frag route will fragment packets. Another way to evade an IDS, uh, say your attack took um, a minute to go through. Try it over five minutes. Try it over a day. All right, so um, one way to avoid, avoid any IDS is to stretch out the horizon. That's known as session splicing. And then finally, Snort uh, is a, the best known IDS in the world. It's a signature-based IDS, but it's a great tool. I don't care what organization I've been to, or what, what IDS system they've standardized on, they all have Snort there as well. All right, uh, so let's bring Alicia back. And uh, Alicia, do you have any questions? In order to allow business to actually take place, some traffic has to be allowed through these firewalls, right? Oh, yeah. In fact, it's pretty safe to say in any, uh, say, imagine a business is a building, that they're going to have something open at port 53, uh, port 25, and possibly port 80, because 53 for my DNS, uh, uh, 25 for mail, and 80 for web, and sometimes 443 if they're going to be doing SSL. So, yeah, you can't get business done if you don't. Uh, as Tom would always say, um, on the Enterprise, they couldn't get anybody on off the ship until they lowered the shields. I can stay covered up real well like this, but I can't do anything. As soon as I throw a punch, I've exposed myself. So you have to expose yourself every time you do business. We just try to limit that exposure. Okay. And um, how exactly does IDS work if traffic is encrypted? It's a big challenge. Now, if we um, look at encryption, and I can do it at the perimeter. So say this is uh, the internet here, and I've got a, uh, some perimeter device, a router, firewall, VPN appliance, and I'm worried about getting uh, traffic uh, VPN to another site. Well, I can do my encryption here at the perimeter, and I can have an IDS right here examine the traffic. Sounds great. Um, but that's a tunnel mode uh, VPN. If I do IPsec in transport mode, it's encrypted here, and the IDS can, can do it. So personally, I would not allow that. That's something by policy. I won't allow it, right? Um, but then we have two other encrypted protocols that are a little challenging. SSL, if you disable and say no SSL in here, you're going to break a lot of business applications. So there's two choices. If I'm worried about people surfing out, I could do what's really kind of a man-in-the-middle attack. I can have an IDS, so to speak, that has a private-public key pair, and I can trust their public key because it's mine as the administrator, and I put it in a client. So when someone opens up an SSL session, they think they're talking to Gmail. Uh, they could first come here. They'll fetch Gmail's uh, public key, generate that session key, and be able to examine things here. If you're going to do this, I have a check with legal and HR, because you might be looking at traffic you're not allowed to, but assuming that this works for you, that's, uh, to call it a man-in-the-middle attack doesn't sell well, so when you're test, and in real life they call these SSL accelerators. But suppose I'm hosting, 
and maybe I have a web server that people SSL to. How about if I just have a proxy server here? I'll have the SSL actually go to this proxy. So people come in here. This decrypts the traffic. My IDS sensor can now look at it, and I pass that in clear text to the actual uh, web server. So my two big choices probably, and it, it, again, it depends on whether you're hosting or you're a client. Uh, now here's the bigger challenge, SSH. SSH typically runs on port 22. I could say, don't allow any port 22 out of here, but we can send anything over anything. And there's no definite header, I don't know. So SSH is a real big challenge with IDSs, and this is why it's the uh, mechanism of choice for botnets today. And the only way we can, we may not be able to do a signature on it, but we can do some type of traffic analysis and just see who were these machines talking to. And that's the way bot, uh, Botnet Hunter works. And um, Botnet Hunter, as far as I know, from uh, uh, people out at um, originally, uh, oh, uh, uh, Santa, uh, I'm sorry, I'm drawing the Palo Alto uh, University, uh, I came up with Botnet Hunter. And it's the best thing I know to track down these botnets, and it's all based on, again, traffic analysis, knowing that this stuff is encrypted. Yeah, so absolutely, IDS and, and encryption doesn't work real well. I can disable some things, Microsoft's PPTP, I could say not allowed, but I can't turn off SSL, I have to allow it. Mm -hmm. And SSH, I can't always find it. Okay. And then I have a question about honeypots. Yes. If, uh, if a honeypot is to be effective, yeah. wouldn't there need to be, for example, like a real mail server behind it? Yes, and that's why if I tried like a tool, if I were like using Nmap and I go SYN on port 25 and I got a SYNAC and I go, oh, that must be a mail server. Mm -hmm. uh, but if I use Telnet and I just, what is it, I'm typing SMTP commands and I'm not getting a, so honeypots generally come in two flavors. If I just SYNAC back, that might be considered a low interaction honeypot. Uh, and, but if I really wanted to be effective, I'm going to have to have a real mail server or a real web server, and those are known as high interaction honeypots. So if someone gets their telnet, they didn't just get the SYNAC back, they're actually getting mail commands back. Absolutely. Okay. Great. Excellent. Cool. Thanks, Larry. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. Now, we hope you've enjoyed this free module, but there's lots more. The Cyber Kung Fu course has 29 videos in all and will really help build you a solid understanding of the CEH version 8 curriculum. Don't forget, if you prefer to attend one of SecureNinja's courses in person at any of our training locations, you really need to visit SecureNinja.com specials for some amazing discounts and other deals. I'm Alicia Webb. Happy training. Secure Ninja TV is brought to you by SecureNinja.com, a world leader in cybersecurity training and certification. Our master instructors will help build you into a highly skilled and marketable security professional. Secure Ninja, forging cybersecurity experts.